Well, let's open in prayer. I uh, will pray for our service today, and um, let's lift up our firefighters and, and officers this morning uh, together. Um, you know, we're, we're blessed that we get to come here this morning and, and just relax and have a time of worship and prayer, but let's not forget uh, those men and women that are protecting uh, lives and property for us. So let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We come to you by faith, God, knowing that you are capable, Lord. You are able to do all things, God. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, we thank you for, first of all, just the cooler day, Lord, and just the relief, Father, that you've brought us. But most of all, God, that it would help the firefighters, Lord, to get a little handle, Lord, in this time, Lord, this window of opportunity that they have that they would get a handle on these fires, Lord. We pray for their safety, Lord. We lift up the family of the firefighter that was killed, Lord, in, in this fire, God, and that they would find comfort and rest in you, Lord. We thank you for that hero, God, a true hero. Father, protect our, our officers, Lord, as, as they patrol, as they make sure that we're safe, God. And so we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to come now, Lord, and worship you. Father, we love you. We Thank you for your people that are here, God, and just pray, Lord, that we're blessed this morning, God. By, we're blessed because we came, Lord. Spend time with you, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the glory. Blessed be your name When the sun shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Sing a give and take away. Give and take away. Give and take away. My heart will choose to say the blessed be your name. You give, you give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say the blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. 
Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the glorious name. Amen. You may be seated. Sing this out with me. And all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough let's sing that again all of you and all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough you are my supply you are my supply my breath of life still more awesome than I know you are my reward worth living for still more awesome than I know in all of you it's more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough more than all I want more than all I need you are more than enough more than all I know, more than all I can say, you are more than enough, and all of you, it's more than enough for all of me, for every thirst and every need, you satisfy me. Your love and all I have in you is more than enough. More than enough. You're more than enough. And all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than Hey man, can you guys please stand with us? All 
the days of my life I want to gaze upon your beauty And seek you in this holy place Let's sing that again, all the days Yes, all the days of my life I want to gaze upon your beauty And seek you in this holy place I fix my eyes on you The author of my faith Casting aside every sin and every way my eyes on you lay my burdens down letting the cares of this world now fade away one thing I ask this one thing I seek that I may dwell in your house alone days of my life I want to gaze upon your beauty and seek you in this holy place Let's say that again fix my eyes Fix my eyes on you, the author of my faith, casting aside every sin and every way. I fix my eyes on you, lay my burdens down, letting the cares of this world now fade away. One thing. One thing I ask. This one thing I seek that I may dwell in your house, O oh Lord, my King. Oh, 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 and all the days of my life, I want to gaze upon your beauty and seek you in. This holy place all the days all the days of my life I want to gaze upon your beauty and seek you in this holy place see that one more time all the days yes all the days of my life I want to gaze upon your beauty and seek you in this holy place. Father, we thank you so much, first of all, for this beautiful day, God, where we can gather out here and we can just worship you, Father. Hear your word. And ask that the Spirit would guide us, lead us into all truth. That the Spirit would give us what we need today. And that, Father, you would be glorified in this place by your people, Lord. And, Father, may we not get complacent, God. May we not get, Lord, just comfortable where we're at, God, at home. You know, uh, again, because of this plague that is upon our nation, and I do call it a plague, God, because a lot of plagues that you brought forth in the scriptures because of the sins of the nation, God. And you're no different today. But God, help us to worship you during this time. Help us to be witnesses to those around us. God, help us not to... to be bummed out and to lose our joy and our song, God. 
but to sing a new song every day, Father, one of quality, one that will lift up those around us, God, and want to know what do you have to sing about? Hey, we, have a, we, we serve a great and wonderful God. And Father, let us, let others know that, God. Let us not mope around and, and complain and, and you know, act like those that don't know you, Father. So may you have your hand upon us today. May you bless uh, our, our firefighters, Lord. Protect them out there on those fires. We pray for our, our policemen. God, our police women, all those that are out there as well, God, their first responders. Lord, may you have your hand upon them and their families, and we pray that you would help, Father, to uh, put these fires out, God. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace upon our nation. We pray for our president, Lord, for our country. Father, for it's going to, be, again, now just, Father, with the passing of the Superior Court, the Supreme Court judge, Lord, we've already hearing the 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 destruction that fathers want they want to bring about god so lord may you have your way with us god lord may you bless our time in your word this morning we pray these things in jesus name amen good morning church why don't you say hi to the person next to you <clears throat> Well, it's great to see all of you. How are you guys doing this morning? Great. Wonderful. Glad to be with you and to be out here in the beautiful, not too hot sunshine. We pray that again, uh, God will keep us focused on the word and not the heat. If you have your Bibles, please open up to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 25 through 32 as We've been following chapter 4, and it's pretty much the life of the body of Christ, the behavior of the new believer. The title this morning is, Are You Grieving the Holy Spirit? Are You Grieving the Holy Spirit? When Paul explained a principle to his people, he wasn't satisfied with just telling them about a principle or explaining it. And then just leaving it at that. He always applied it to the different areas of life that needed to feel its power. He even had the boldness to name sins in these verses. And he told us to stay away from them. And he explained why. The bottom line is that a believer is different than the unbeliever. The new man was created in true righteousness, Paul said in, ver in the verse just before this section of, of Scripture, in verse 24. He says, the new man was created in, in, in true righteousness and holiness. And this shows us that this is the imputed righteousness. The righteousness that comes because we're in Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ. And that everything we do should match God's holy character. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And since we've been declared righteous, and we're in Christ, and we're seated in the heavenly, so our walk down here should match our position. And then Paul goes on and he gives some specifics for our new life in Christ, for the new man, for the new woman. The only sure proof that a person is saved is a consistent life that imitates Christ. Not perfect, but consistent. Not because they say they're Christian or because they go to church, but because they do so. They imitate the life of Christ. And that's going to be the topic already for next week, to be imitators of Jesus Christ. John wrote this in 1 John 2, 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments or obey his word is a liar. I love how the Bible doesn't mince words. The Bible calls it the way it is. 
And John says he's a liar and the truth is not in him. Now the word truth here means the reality clearly lying before our eyes as compared to a mere appearance without reality. In other words, what appears real before our eyes is not. It doesn't have the reality of what appear, appears to be. New creatures in Christ act like new creatures. Paul has just shown us in our study last, uh, last Sunday in verses 17 through 24, he showed us the new man and the nature of the new man. The new man believes and know, the believers know salvation to be putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Remember like an old shirt, an old pair of shoes. Something that's old and of no value. You put it off and you put on the new man in Christ. The strange thing about the life, uh, the Christian life is that God's sovereignty and man's will are at work together. And the faithful believer obeys God's sovereign commands. Then after showing what believers are and have in Christ <clears throat> in chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians, Paul first gives general, simple instructions for the reason of living the new life in Christ in verses 1 through 24 here in chapter 4. And then in the rest of the letter, he gives specific instructions on how to live that life as a husband and wife, as an employee, as children, as parents. In verses 25 through 32, Paul describes several differences between the old life and the new life. And based on the, new, on the believer's new life, Believers are to quit lying and tell the truth. They're to stop getting angry for personal offenses and be angry at those who offend their fellow man and the Lord. And they're to be angry and they're to stop stealing and to start sharing. They're to stop using corrupt words and use gracious words and they're to turn from fleshly sins to supernatural qualities. Therefore, Paul begins, notice in verse 25, therefore. The therefore takes us to what he just said before this. All the things that he spoke about, the, the nature of the old man and, and the nature of the new man. And what the new man and how they're supposed to live. Is, he, he's saying, therefore, in, ju what, in, in what just I told you before this, he says again, therefore, putting away lying. Let each one of you speak with truth his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So the therefore, like I said, after describing the old life in verses 20 through 24, he now describes how the new believer should live the new life here in verses 25 through 32. And he starts off by saying, stop lying. Stop lying. A lie is something you say that's contrary to facts spoken with the intent to deceive. You say something, but with the intent to deceive, you're, you're not going to follow through with it. Now, this doesn't mean that anybody who ever told a lie is going to go to hell. But rather, those whose lives are controlled by lies, they love lies, and they make lies, are lost forever. The Christian's life is controlled by truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. He is the truth. We should follow the truth because we are members of one another. Did you know? Did you know that all liars are going to hell? Among other sins. Revelation 21, 8 says, All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. John just said a few minutes ago, those who don't obey the commands of God, he's a liar. And he just said here where liars are going to go. If a person lies all the time, he has no biblical reason for thinking he's a Christian. And the person who continually lies is really a child of Satan and not of God. Now, sad to say it, but lying is a normal thing in the world with the unsaved. And our society depends a lot on lying. 
Before I was saved, I, lying was no big deal to me. So many lies, one after another, every day, and so many organizations and businesses and economies and governments and contracts are built on lies. Exaggeration is lying. In other words, when you have to add something that isn't true to what starts out to be true, it's a lie. And a half-truth is a whole lie. Cheating in school. On your income tax returns. Promises we don't keep. Betraying somebody's confidence and making excuses. They're all forms of lying. The Christian shouldn't lie at all. Paul says they are to put away lies. He's to be known for his honesty because lying and the new life cannot coexist in the same heart with his new nature. And it's unacceptable to the Lord. The Christian is to stop lying so that he can honestly serve the Lord. Now verse 25 here uh, quotes Zechariah 8.16. The church cannot function the way it's supposed to if the members, if we're lying to each other or if we don't serve with each other honestly and lovingly. We can't minister to each other effectively or with each other if we don't speak the truth in love, especially among our fellow believers. Verses 26 and 27. Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. The next thing that the new believer is to do is to put off fleshly anger. Now, the anger mentioned here isn't just one of those quick outbursts of anger that, well, I just, you know, it, it just went out, it just slipped. It's not, inner it's not an inner boiling bitterness. It's a deeply rooted, unyielding and decided conviction. And this anger can be good or bad depending on why you're angry. Paul's command is be angry, yet don't sin. Be angry under certain conditions, but don't sin. Righteous indignation is being angry at wickedness. In other words, things that are done against the Lord Jesus, against his will, against his work. It's the anger that the Lord's people have who hate evil. And we are to hate evil. We are to hate the things that God hates, as well as love the things that God loves. It's the anger that hates unfairness, immorality, and all kinds of ungodliness. Jesus showed his righteous anger at the Pharisees. When they got upset with him because he healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. It was probably the same kind of anger that caused Jesus to drive the money changers out of the temple. Because they were making God's house a den of thieves. It was probably the, uh, Jesus was always angered when his father was slandered or when others were treated wrong. But Jesus was never angry when it was personal. Anger is sin when it becomes personal. That's resentful about something that's done to me. You know, if somebody you know, says something to me or, or treats me uh, in a way that maybe I don't like, and then I get angry, that's a sin. But when we see somebody tra treat our fellow man, our neighbor, our brother, our sister, or somebody, you know, God's, God's uh, you know, mankind, that's okay. That's righteous indignation. Anger is sin when it's personal. personal. Because again, it, it's resentful about something done to self, and it's the anger that leads to murder and God's judgment. Remember what the Lord said to Cain in Genesis 4, 6 through 7? When he got angry at his brother Abel because Cain's sacrifice wasn't accepted and his brother's was, God asked Cain, hey, why are you angry, Cain? 
Why are you angry? God's trying to get him to confess. God's trying to get him to do the right thing. And he, and he says, and why has your countenance fallen? He could see it on his face. And you can see anger in a person's face. And then God says, Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Do the right thing, Cain. You'll be okay. But if you don't do well, then God warned him. Sin lies at the door. See, the longer you hold anger in about somebody sins at the door it's ready to pounce on you and sooner or later it's going to get the best of you and god says its desire is for you cain it wants to eat you up cain but it says he says you shall rule over it the lord said to jonah in chapter 4 verse 4 is it right jonah for you to be angry Again, notice he questions them. He wants to, to get the answer from Job. He wants to, the, the confession to come from us. Job was angry because he knew the grace and the mercy of God and how he was going to spare the Ninevites. Anger that's selfish, that's out of control and vengeful, it is sinful and it does not belong in the Christian life, not even for a second. But anger that's unselfish, and based on love for God and others, it's allowed and it's biblical. But be careful. Because even righteous anger can easily become bitterness, resentfulness, and self-righteousness. So Paul goes on to say, he says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. He says, don't stay angry. Don't give place to the devil. Don't compromise with the devil. Even righteous anger can become bad, so we need to get rid of it as soon as possible before the day is over. If you go to sleep angry, you're giving the devil an open door for him to use you. If you stay angry, you might start looking for a way to get even. Because, because breaking God's principle of repay no one for evil with evil and have regard for good things in the sight of all men. God, Paul said, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, notice, live peaceably with all men. Now, I've heard people say, well, you know, I went and I said, I'm sorry, I, I confess, and, you know, I want to make things like, but they, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to, you know, accept it. You know what? You leave them to God. God says, as much as lies within you, your responsibility is to make it right. And if they don't want to, then they are going to deal with God. That's between them and God. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to. Uh, uh, beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. You know, let it go. For it is written, "Vengeance is mine; I will repay," says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, notice, feed him. If he's if he's thirsty, give him to drink, because in doing so, notice, you will heap coals of fire on his head. In other words, hopefully, it will bring conviction to them. But do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 17 through 21. Now we know, we've probably all experienced, I mean, anger can come in a flash. And it can take over a believer. And because it has such a strong tendency to grow and to boil over, it needs to be dealt with immediately. Confess it, forsake it, and give it to God before the day is out. Whether you're angry for a good reason or not, if you feed it, Satan's going to take advantage of it. And he'll feed our anger with pride and self-pity and self-righteousness and vengeance. And he'll say, hey, man, defend your rights. And every other kind of selfish sin and disobedience to God's will. Here's the next thing that Paul says to put off. Look at verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Paul says, Stop stealing. Now, I think we've probably all been tempted, if we would admit it to steal at some time. Now you might be thinking, oh no, you know, I, I, you know something, I, I steal a car, or, you know, steal something big like that. No, there's no way, I've never. 
You know, our fallen nature, the, of the, uh, the old self, it has a tendency to steal. And that's just one of the many sinful traits of the old man. That the new man, who's created in the likeness of God, is to put away. The Christian is not to steal anything, anytime. Now here's how the Lord spoke to me about this verse in my maturing in Christ. Shoplifting is a big problem today. And most businesses, business losses are due to employee theft. What's well, taking a pencil here and there? It's stealing. I don't care how much you minimize it. It doesn't belong to you or me. A few rubber bands for my desk in the, at, my, at my house. A few paper clips. This company makes billions of dollars, millions of dollars. They're not going to miss it. It's the character that God's looking at. Lunch breaks. If we're not taking the prescribed amount of time and we're going longer, we're stealing from the company. Witnessing while you're at work. I'm not paid to witness. I'm paid to do work for the company. Oh, and here's the one that makes everybody cringe. Calling out sick from work when you're not sick. Stealing from the company. Character. Character. And I remember when I call out sick, I went, I just cringe. I just got to the point of saying, oh, I'm, I, I'm not coming in today. <laughs> I'm not coming in today. And I, 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 you know, I just stopped saying that, you know. And it's, it's amazing they never, okay, but I'm not coming in. Now, I don't know how well that will go over, but I, I wasn't lying to them. I wasn't coming in, but I didn't say I'm not coming in because I'm sick. How about purposely overestimating a job? Embezzlement. Those are widespread in business and industry. Padding expense accounts, if you have to do the department budget. Reporting more hours than really worked. Not reporting my income to the IRS for all that I made. All of these are accepted as normal by a lot of people in the world today, and the reason is everybody does it. Christians shouldn't do it. To them, stealing, to the world, stealing is just a game as long as you don't get caught. There's no shame, there's no guilt, there's no harm. Not paying your debts, not paying your fair wages, keeping the change if the person at the register gives you too much back. They're all forms of stealing. There are so many ways that we can steal. Stealing is sin, and it has no part in the new life of the new man in Christ. Paul says a better, you know, a better thing to do, a better option for stealing is working. So that you can give those who are in need to help them. And it's God's plan for everyone to work if they can work. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 and 11. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, The Christian who doesn't work and provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And our work, Paul said, should be in what is good. Notice verse 28. Let him who stole no long, steal no longer, but rather let him work, working with his hands. Notice what is good. Our work should be in what is good. Work that's honest, honorable, and productive. The word good here in verse 28, it suggests that which is good in quality. The kind of work that you do. It refers to work that honors God. In other words, a Christian should not be involved in a job or a profession or work or business that requires compromising God's standards that dishonor Him. In a job that breaks His holy commands. And especially if you're asked to lie for the boss or for a situation. Or misleads or harms others in any way. Every person is to provide for themselves and even more to share with those who, who 
you know, because of devastation or capacity are in need. Not only should our work not hurt anybody, it should be for the specific reason or purpose to help them, to share with those in need. A Christian's desire to earn more should be so that they're able to give more and to help more rather than to have more. More than just providing for his own family or his own basic needs. He gets more so that he can give more. And like the rest of his life, a Christian's occupation, directly or indirectly, should above all else be a way of serving God and others. I like this quote, or, or this, what was written by Dorothy L. Sayers. She said, work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. It is or should be the full expression of the worker's faculties, the thing in which he finds spiritual, mental, and bodily satisfaction, and the medium in which he offers himself to God. Verse 2930, the next thing, next thing Paul says that the new man is to put off. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul says, put off hurtful words. Another change in the Christian's life should be to put off corrupt words or, speak, or speaking hurtful words and speak helpful and healing words. The new man's speech should be transformed along with everything else in their life. The word corrupt here, it speaks of something that's rotten. Something that's worthless. Like a piece of fruit or a vegetable. Once it gets rotten, it, 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 it's no good. It's worthless. Foul language should never come from a Christian's mouth because it's not natural to the new life in Christ. Corrupt language should be displeasing to us. Just like a piece of rotten meat or, or, or rotten food. Off-color jokes, profanity, dirty stories, cussing, innuendos, and every other kind of talk should never come from our lips. And James tells us, he tells us in chapter 3, verse 6 through 8, I mean, he tells us that the tongue is really hard to control. As a matter of fact, he doesn't have a lot of good things to say about the tongue. He says of the tongue, it's a fire. It's a world of iniquity. It's set on fire by hell. It's full of deadly poison. And I'm sure we could add to that, that list. He said you can tame almost every kind of animal but the tongue. And then on top of putting away corrupt and damaging language, we're to develop speech that's good, that's edifying, that's gracious, that's pleasing to God. Before you speak, ask yourself these three things. Does what you say help or hinder? Heal or scar? Build up or tear down? Our words should edify, build up by helping, or I should say by helpful, constructive, encouraging, instructive, and uplifting words. But sometimes they have to be for correction, which is also edifying when it's done in the right spirit. And understand, when somebody comes across to you in the wrong way or says something that gets to you, remember how you respond is just as bad as the way that person approached you works both ways. Solomon tried to find acceptable words and that was written uh, and what he wrote was upright words of truth when he said the words of the wise are like goads and well-driven nails in Ecclesiastes 12, 10 through 11. A goad was 
was like a prod. They used it. It used. It came from the use of a prod or a, a pointed stick. They they poked the cattle to get them to move to to you know motivate them to get moving. And Solomon said, "The words of the wise are like goads, well-driven nails to 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 inspire them, to stir them up." And everything that we say should be good, that is appropriate, based on the, the need of the situation at the time, at the moment. Every word that comes out of our mouth does not have to be deep and it doesn't have to be important. But you know what? It should always fit the situation so that it helps everybody. And we should never unnecessarily say things that might hurt or discourage, or disappoint somebody else. But even though some things might be totally true and totally perfectly good, it's best not to say them. Everybody likes the wisdom and the goodness of people who speak less. But when they do speak, man, it's something helpful something they needed to hear. Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Proverbs 15, 23 says, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season. Notice how good it is. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous, notice, studies how to answer. That is, they think before they say what they're going to say. But the mouth of the wicked, it pours forth evil. Whatever we say should be gracious so that it can give grace to those who are listening to the hearers. The mature Christian not only speaks the truth, but he speaks it in love because he's concerned about the other person's feelings. Cold Harsh truth is seldom appropriate or helpful. More often it's destructive than constructive. We have been saved by grace. We're kept by grace. So we're to live and speak in grace. Just the way grace totally describes God, it should also describe his children. Graciousness always characterized Jesus. Isaiah said in Isaiah 50, verse 4, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season who is weary. To him who is weary. Paul said in Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And as we've been taught earlier, salt is a preservative. It helps to slow down decay. And the gracious words of a Christian's help slow down the moral and spiritual decay in the world around them. They also give strength and comfort to those that are in need. Our graciousness reflects the grace of Jesus Christ who uses our gracious graciousness to draw others to his grace. And here's why we're to put off corrupt talk. Very important here, notice, so we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an it. The Holy Spirit has feelings. It has a mind. He thinks. He sees. He talks. He's a person the third person of God. And what we say and what we do, it grieves him. The word grieve means to afflict with sorrow. And when we say harsh and, and cruel things to our brothers and sisters and you know, to people in the world, we afflict the Holy Spirit with sorrow because we're not reflecting the, the, the character of Christ, the graciousness of Christ, the words of Christ. All sin grieves God. But man, when his children sin, it breaks his heart. 
Now, as a parent, you know what? When you, when you see your, your, your neighbor's kids being disobedient or doing something wrong, you know, it, it, it grieves your heart because you hate to see it. But man, when it's your child, oh, it hurts a lot more. You grieve because that's my child. When Christians refuse to change their old ways from the, to the new ways, God is sad. He's grieved, and the Holy Spirit weeps. When he sees Christians lying instead of telling the truth, when they get angry when somebody offends them rather than righteously angered for harm that's done to their brother or sister or to the Lord, or when they're stealing instead of sharing or cussing and telling dirty jokes and gossiping instead of speaking encouraging and gracious words. Whatever is done against God's will and the holiness of the heart, it will grieve the Holy Spirit. And if you grieve the Holy Spirit, it can lead to quenching the Holy Spirit. And you lose power and you lose blessing in your life. Because God does not bless disobedience. He judges it. Look at verses 31 through 32 now. Paul says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Paul says here, this is going from now natural sin to supernatural goodness. The last change that Paul talks about is turning away from the fleshly sins to the supernatural qualities, and he adds them to the list of the other changes he's just given us. That's a lot of work, isn't it, to live that kind of life? But we're not doing it on our own. There's supernatural qualities. There are the work of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. He gives us the ability to do it. We can't do it on our own. Man has a natural desire to sin, and that natural desire to sin is to grow into greater sin if we don't stop it. And a Christian's sin will grow just like an unbeliever's sin grows if it's uncontrolled. Our inner sins of bitterness and wrath and anger will surely lead to, to the outward sins of clamor. The word clamor here means harsh words and slander. He said, and other examples of malice. The word malice means wickedness as an evil habit of the mind. And bitterness. We're not to have bitterness. Bitterness is a slow-burning resentment. It's a lingering, grudge-filled attitude. And it's the spirit of irritability that keeps a person always bitter, making him sour and forgiving. Wrath says here, Paul, it has to do with wild rage. It's the passion of the moment, anger. The word anger is more of an inner smoldering, a restrained and deep feeling. Getting back to clamor, it's yelling harsh words that, that, that are, it, it's, it's from strife showing that you've lost control. You've lost self-control. When you begin to speak these, these harsh words. Solomon said in Proverbs 25, 28, whoever has no rule over his spirit, that is, whoever has no self-control over their spirit, they're like a city that's broken down without walls. A city that had walls built around it was a lot less vulnerable to the enemies who wanted to come in and attack it. When the desert thieves would go through the land, and they looked for cities to, to destroy and to rob. They looked for the city that didn't have a wall. There's no defense. And that's what Solomon's saying here. If you have no self-control over your spirit, your anger, whatever it might be, Satan has a, will have a field day with you. He's going to come in, and he's going to have his way with you. The word evil speaking here is where we get, our, get blasphemy from. 
Evil speaking is the continuing slander of somebody that comes from, a, that, that slander of someone that comes from a bitter heart. The continuing slander of someone that comes from a bitter heart. Paul then adds malice here. Malice is the general word for evil that's the root of all sins. He says all these things have to be put off. All of them. No pet sins. We're not to baby any of them or harbor any of them. We're to put them all off. Now these specific sins involved involve conflict between two people. These specific sins involve conflict between two people, the believer and the unbeliever. And it's even worse when it's between believer and believer. Because you see, these are the sins that break fellowship, friendship, and they destroy relationships, and they destroy the effectiveness and the witness of the church in Jesus Christ. It weakens the church and it spoils its testimony in front of the whole world. It's sad that they already have a bad view of the church. When an unbeliever sees Christians acting just like the rest of the world, in his eyes the church is tarnished. And when he sees us acting like the world, he's even more sure in his mind why I shouldn't believe in the Bible. That's why I don't go to church. That's why I don't believe the Bible. That's why I don't believe what those Christians say. Paul says here at the end of these verses, in the place of those sins, we are to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. These are graces that God has shown us, and they're the gracious qualities that we are to show each other. God didn't love us or choose us because we were wonderful. <laughs> didn't save us because we deserved it. But purely because he's gracious. No other reason. And if God is so gracious to us, how much more then should we be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving to, our fel to, to fellow sinners and especially to each other? The word tender harder here, it's the idea of being compassionate and it reflects a, a feeling deep down inside the heart of our emotions. It's a gnawing feeling. It's an eating away emotional pain to compassion or of compassion for somebody's need. Again, it's something that eats away at you. It's something that, that I have this, this compassion to meet the need of somebody. That's being tender hearted. And then forgiving each other is so basic when it comes to showing Christ-like character that you don't really have to say a lot about it. So in closing, one of the best examples of forgiveness is in the parable of Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 20, uh, 235. When Peter asked, remember how often should we forgive? Seven times seven? No, 70 times, seven times 70, 70 times 70. It's not a matter of how much. It's a matter of character. Character. And then Jesus told Peter the story about a man who owed his creditor a huge uh, debt. But the creditor who, creditor, who was his king, forgave him his huge debt. This was a picture of salvation. God forgave us through Christ for a huge debt that we couldn't pay. God forgiving a sinner, the unpayable debt of sin and rebellion against him. The forgiven man then went to someone who owed, him, who owed him a small amount. But he put him in prison because he couldn't pay back that small debt. That man who was so excited because he was forgiven this huge debt that he couldn't pay wouldn't forgive a small debt that was easy to pay the debt of another person. His wrong behavior shows the terrible wickedness of a believer's unforgiving heart, and he was severely chastened by the Lord for his wicked attitude. Paul has this same relationship in mind as he calls for believers to forgive, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. 
And if we find it hard to forgive, remember that God forgave us when, when we came to his son, Jesus Christ. And if God can forgive you and me for all that we've, that we've done, you know, surely we can do the far lesser task of forgiving others who have done us wrong. Men did and have done a lot more wrong to Jesus Christ than any man has ever done to you or me. So we, God's people of all people, should always be willing to forgive. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful passage, Lord. And Father, may it be more than just a beautiful passage and beautiful words, God or just a study that we like, Lord. But God, may it be something we apply to our life, God. May it not just be something we hear. May it not just be something that we know. May it be something we do, God, in our life every day. Though we're not perfect, may we be consistent, Lord. May that be our goal. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or if you're watching on the internet. But the Holy Spirit has brought conviction to your heart. Or maybe some of these sins you've been carrying or harboring. You can make it right with God right now. If you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior... Repeat these words after me. As if you were saying them to you're saying them to Jesus Christ intimately and personally. Dear Jesus, I confess to you, Lord, I am a sinner and I have sinned. Please conf please forgive me of all of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me brand new. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me now to put off the old man and put on the new and to walk with you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. I want to pray now for the offering. Again, we have the box out here, or if online, however you want to do it. But I want to give thanks to the Lord for offering, and again, for His continuous of, of providing for us. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the provision, God, of, of taking care of us financially, Lord. We know that you are the great supplier, the great provider, Lord. Father, you don't miss a beat. You've taken care of us for over 20 years, Lord, and we just... We've done nothing, Lord, but preach your word and gather and worship you, Lord. Everything else is, le is left up to you, Lord. We thank you so much. So, Lord, may you be pleased with us. God, may you be pleased with the offering we give unto you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, a quick announcement. The ladies' study is starting up this coming Thursday at 7 o'clock. So, ladies, come and get blessed. I know it's a great time of fellowship and a time of needed fellowship especially in the times that we're in. So, you know, get out, come on down, and, and be a part of the Ladies Fellowship and the Ladies uh, Starting uh, Bible Study Series. And also tonight, I want to encourage you to um, also Spanish stu studies. The Spanish translation will start next Sunday. All right, for those that, that want to bring, those that uh, may not uh, know English that well, we will have a, a Spanish translation for them starting next Sunday here at 10 o'clock. And lastly, I would encourage you to come and join us in the study of our uh, psalm tonight. It's Psalm 137. It's an awesome psalm. It's about the time that the children of Israel were in captivity. They were taken by the Babylonians, and they had lost their song. And, I, and as I was looking over that, that psalm, it reminded me of the time that we're in right now. They were taken out of their element. They were held captive by the Babylonians, and many people are feeling captive right now. 
And like this, like the Israelites, they lost their song. And I think a lot of Christians have lost their song. They're not coming to church. They're just staying home. They're doing whatever. Now we can come out of here and we can worship. But here's the kicker. The Babylonians, I'm already giving you the study, but I just want to just get it, in, get it in your mind in case you don't come. The Babylonians had heard about the hundreds of thousands of Israelites that used to worship or used to gather at the feast. And they would hear the worship of the Israelites. And it said they heard, they'd never heard anything like that. And then when they went into captivity, the Babylonians came up and said, hey, well, sing us one of those songs of Jerusalem. And they were crying and said, we've lost our song. We can't sing our song over here. I mean, we need to sing our song, church, so that everybody can hear it. So it's an awesome psalm, and I encourage you to come and just get blessed. God bless you guys. Amen. Can you please stand with us? It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Sing it with me. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 It may look. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 Hey, look. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. How I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Amen. God bless you guys.